Well, hello there. I didn't see you. But now that I've got you here, let's talk about the Trinity. Follow me. I'm often asked, Ian, what's up with the Trinity? But I think in order to answer that question, we need to pull apart two, que two questions. The first regarding the metaphysics of the Trinity. What exactly is the Trinity? And the second question regards the mechanics of the Trinity. How does the Trinity work? Now, in the previous video, Josh Paul told you a little bit about what the Trinity is. So rather than hash that out again, I'm going to tell you why we believe the Trinity is three persons and one being. Here, hold these for me. Back to the Trinity. So why believe God is three persons and one being? Let's start with scripture. Regarding the Father, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 reads, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is a common salutation for the Apostle Paul and oftentimes he's referring to God as Father. Regarding Jesus, Mark 14, 61 through 62 reads, Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now this is important because Jesus is referencing a prophecy in Daniel that was specifically about God. In other words, Jesus is calling himself God. And in Colossians 1, 16, 17, we are told that Jesus is God. It says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Regarding the Spirit, Acts 5, 3-4 reads, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And so in this scene, we see Peter using Holy Spirit and God interchangeably as it relates to Ananias' lie. Now, it's not just scripture that supports the Trinity, but historically that has been the position of the church. Let's look at the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, he proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. And so in the Nicene Creed, we see the apostles and the early church leaders suggesting that both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share attributes, share essences, and are of the divine nature. Now, philosophically, there's also reason to believe that God is triune. That is, He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. William Lane Craig offers the following probabilistic argument. God is by definition the greatest conceivable being. As the greatest conceivable being, God must be perfect. Now a perfect being must be a loving being. For love is a moral perfection. God therefore must be a perfectly loving being. Now it is of the very nature of love to give oneself away. Love reaches out to another person rather than centering wholly in oneself. So if God is perfectly loving by his very nature, he must be giving himself in love to another. But who is this other that God is giving himself away to, since we've not been here since before creation? It seems that there had to be something within God, something internal to God that allowed him to share this love. And this is where the Trinity comes into play. For Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been in a perfect love, perfect harmony, three persons in one being. Let's talk about the mechanics of the Trinity. Now, I had to be honest, I don't really know how it works. But the truth is, I don't think anybody knows how it works. And all the analogies that I've heard, I really dislike. The Trinity being ice, water, and steam, really? The Trinity being a three-leaf clover? It seems like Every analogy, when it's pushed hard enough, 
ends up falling into some heresy that the Nicene Creed was trying to combat. Now this is troubling for some people because they like to know how things work. But the truth is, you don't have to know how something works in order to know that it exists. Let's take this car for example. Most people believe in cars. Most people drive cars. But very few people know how they work. In fact, right now, I was just pretending to work on this car. I have no idea what I'm doing. Now I know what you're thinking. Ian, that's a ridiculous comparison. I can see my car, I can hear my car, I can touch my car. And while empirical evidence is valuable and welcomed, it's not the only form of evidence, and sometimes it's not even the adequate form. What we've tried to do in this video is offer you biblical, historical, and philosophical support that God is Trinity. So while we may not understand how it works, we can rest assured that Yahweh is Father, Son, Holy Spirit.